I think everybody, and at least anybody that's dealing with soybeans, knows that uh, last year was uh, trying, at least to some extent, when it comes to, to one certain pest that we haven't dealt with in a long time, and that's red banded stink bugs. I think we did as good of a job as, as we knew how to do based on the fact that we had no information really going into this thing on management. Uh, we relied very heavily on our colleagues at LSU, and we appreciate all the, uh, all the information that they shared with us. But I'll tell you, since then, and, and like our group in the Mid-South always does, uh, Mississippi, Arkansas, uh, West or Tennessee, and uh, Louisiana, we took advantage of that situation, and we generated a ton of data last year. Now again, that, that's hindsight for last year. But what we're gonna, if we have this problem in the future, I think we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be ahead of the game now, finally. But what I want to do today, what I really want to do, is set up Gus Lorenz, and I've sent him some of the Mississippi data. He's got tons of data that him and Nick Bateman conducted over at Arkansas. But we have generated a lot of data, and there'll be some changes, and I'm going to introduce some of those changes to you today. And what Gus is going to do, Gus is going to come up here and show you a lot of the. Uh, a little more of the data and some of the things that support some of the things that we're going to tell you today. But one of the things I quickly realized, because when you're dealing with a pest that you don't deal with very often, there's a lot of questions about that pest, obviously. Now we did as much, as good of a job as we knew how, keeping you informed through newsletters on the Mississippi crop situation. Some of y'all may remember we even did an emergency red banded stink bug forum in Stoneville that was very well attended. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get kind of basic. This is not really the talks that I normally give, but again, I'm trying to set up my colleague, Dr. Gus Lorenz. So I'm going to go into this and uh, hit some very basic things, answer some questions, a lot of the questions that I got throughout the year, and uh, then, we're going to, then we're going to get Dr. Lorenz up to kind of finish this. All right, so first and foremost, this is just our common stink bug species that we deal with in Mississippi and really the Mid-South in general, predominantly. We got the green stink bug, which is something that we deal with to some extent, I would say, every year. Uh, then we got the southern green. This is one that we deal with more so probably in Mississippi, Louisiana, South, South uh, Arkansas than Tennessee. But this is one that can get really high numbers. This one don't like cold winters, like we'll talk about with red bandits, so it comes and goes. But when this one's here, some of you may remember from, from years ago, when you can hit those 50 to 7,500 per 25 type sweep numbers with our traditional stink bug species, it's going to be southern greens. The nymphs have spots, pretty easy to, to identify. Well, then we got the brown. We deal with browns every year. We deal with them in, in various crops, but we deal with them in soybeans. This one's a little different. And it's different because it's harder to kill with pyrethroid insecticides. Typically, when, when this one's in the mix, then we'll start switching to some organophosphate type materials, the, at least the, the best we can. With the pyrethroids, typically something like bifenthrin, oftentimes we only see 50, 60 percent control in soybeans with, with this particular one. And I always put this one on there uh, in the bottom right corner, the spine soldier bug. And I put it on there for a couple reasons. One is it looks a lot like a brown stink bug. And it is actually a beneficial. I mean, these things are, are, are great on caterpillars. And we've seen a lot of them this year uh, when the looper kind of outbreak hit us. There's lots of pictures going around between ourselves and others sending me of, the, of this spine soldier bug running around with a looper on this proboscis. But this is a beneficial insect. And this is one you don't want to count in your sweeps. And I'm not going to get too, too deep into that. But keep in mind, they, they're pretty similar to a, to a, brown, uh, a brown stink bug. This is where some confusion starts coming in. We're just going to jump right in here to, to red banded stink bugs. Honestly, there's only really probably one thing you'll ever confuse this thing with, the red, the red banded uh, being on your left, that's the adult and the nymph, but the red shouldered stink bug. Now, we don't typically see a lot of red shouldered stink bugs, but they're not uncommon at all. In fact, we see them pretty regularly. The thing about a red, a red shouldered, though, is they die like greens and southern greens, so we don't worry about them a whole lot. But they are as confusing, and we found quite a few this year. And I'm gonna go into some detail on this, but you can see instantly that the nymphs, you should never be confused by the nymphs, it's the adults. So we're just gonna start at the beginning, and I'm gonna go through the various life stages of red banded stink bugs, because I bet I've had a million texts this summer on is this a red banded, is this a red banded? So I'm gonna go through some stuff. 
All right. Egg identification. Red bandits have a very unique uh, cluster of eggs that they lay. They're always laid in rows of two, and they tend to be dark gray or black in color. They're always in rows of two, though. There's one other stink bug, at least that I can think of off the top of my head, that lays eggs in rows of two, at least stink bugs, and that's the rice stink bug, except they'll be, they won't be dark in color. Kudzu bugs also lay eggs in rows of two, but they're not dark in color either. But red-banded stink bugs, many of you probably saw this this year. I've got tons of them in my net sweeping or in drop cloths or whatever. Uh, one thing different, too, about the way they lay their eggs red-banded is the eggs are red-banded. They tend to be laid uh, down in the canopy on the stems, petioles, and pods rather than up on the leaves. Now, you'll find them up on the leaves, but they do lay lower in the plant a lot of times directly on the fruiting uh, structures. When the nymphs hatch, first instar nymphs of stink bugs are pretty can, can be confusing because you'll you'll get the spine soldier bug in there and you'll get everything else in there. But these are fairly unique. This is a really good picture from a graduate student of Gus's. Joe Black uh, took this picture on a pollinator tour we was on this summer. But one of the things about that very first instar of red banded stink bugs is they have that bright red abdomen. There's not a lot you can confuse that with that's up on the plant. Now, burrower bugs look similar, but they'll be down in the, you know, in the residue on the soil. So if you zoom in on this a little bit, there's a shot of the nymphs, the first instar nymphs. Now, the picture to the top right, this is several of the different instars. Now, keep in mind, too, that red-banded stink bug, the shape of their body, at least to me, is always sort of football shape. So that kind of clues you in immediately. I cannot think of any other stink bugs just right off the top of my head in their early instars that have that, that football shape to them. So that clues you in. Now as you get to the larger instars, the fourth and the fifth instars, like you see in the bottom picture, that's on either side of that adult, then they get, they're still sort of football shape, but they get those lines down sort of the middle of the body. But that, what you're looking at in this picture is essentially all of the life stages of the immature. They're pretty unique looking. I don't think you'll have trouble identifying this immature of a red bandit. And it's important to be able to do that. Now, when it comes to the adult, I've seen a lot of different color phases. And, and the pictures that you're always seeing on the internet, social media, whatever you're doing, is typically the one on the top left corner. It's that perfect looking red banded stink bug with a bright red stripe across his shoulders. Well, I'm here to tell you there is a large percentage of the population that does not look like that. They still have that stripe like you see in the middle picture, and I believe this is a picture by Scott Stewart if I remember right, but the band will almost be uh, sort of a beige color. That's real common. We see that a lot. Or you see the top right picture is more of a brown color. So it's not always that bright red color. But the point of this one is, the shoulders on this pest compared to a red-shouldered stink bug are much more rounded. A red-shouldered stink bugs, although they're not pointed, they have somewhat of a shoulder that defines them. But if you really want to know what you're dealing with, here's the foolproof method. And once you do this a couple times, I can guarantee you, you'll never have to do it again. But a red-banded stink bug has a spine between the hind legs that is visible with your naked eye. You do not need a hand lens. You might need your reading glasses, I do, but you don't need a hand lens. You can see this spine. If you flip that stink bug over, if it has that red stripe, it fits the description of a red banded stink bug, and that spine is present, it is a red banded. And after you look at a few, you'll start getting familiar with them from the top side, that shoulder part of it, and you'll know what you're dealing with. So that's just a couple of things about identification. Uh, it's important to be able to identify these because we're treating these things different. So that's why it's so important to be able to identify them. So where did this thing come from? I had to, to do a bunch of research the other day before I did this talk to try to figure all this out. But this thing was first described in St. Vincent, in the island of St. Vincent, by a guy named Stoner in 1922. So this thing's been around for a long time. It's actually been in the U.S. for a long time at some level. In the 60s, it was in South Carolina, Florida, Georgia, and New Mexico was found. About this same time, in the late 60s, they were finding it in Brazil. This is a neotropical insect. I mean, it's essentially native to that Caribbean, South America type area. It's made its way to the U.S. By the 70s, it had made its way as a significant pest in Brazil. So it's down there, and it is a problem down there. 
So this thing has been around, I guess you could say, to some extent for, for a long time. It's just when we have years like we've had uh, that are warm winters, this thing is, uh, this is when it's blowing up in these high numbers and causing us a problem this far north. Louisiana first reported it in 2000. And this is a map I got, I don't know if I got it from Hank Jones or somebody, but this is a, is a map of Louisiana just showing where they found it in the early 2000s. And by 2006, it made its way all the way up uh, to the north side of Louisiana. Now our first dealings with this, other than a very rare occasion, was in 2009. And everybody remembers, I think, 2009, because that was the year that we had just horrific rains at harvest, tremendous quality problems. Well, that was also the same year that we actually treated a lot of red bandit. Now, what we, we really haven't had the problem since then until 16. We started seeing some in 16. Now, although they showed up in these counties in 2009, what we didn't see in 2009 that was much different than the tail end, the late planted soybeans in 2016 and certainly in 2017, what we did not see then was just those huge numbers blowing back into fields like we saw in some areas this year. So uh, this thing comes and goes depending on the, we the weather and I'll talk a little bit about that. So what's it out there feeding on? I think Drake Copeland here mentioned it in the cover crop symposium this morning, uh, some of the legumes. Obviously soybeans is a host, but the legumes, about any legume is somewhat of a host. Crimson clover seems to be one of the biggest ones. And that is where we can find large numbers of red banded stink bugs. Now, we saw some plots this year. Scott Stewart and myself was on this, this pollinator tour type thing and we were looking at pollinator habitat. How many of y'all are familiar with partridge pea? Y'all know what that is? We found every life stage on partridge pea and that was one of the things they were planting in these pollinator crops. Uh, a legume, obviously, but they were definitely on it and they were reproducing on it. Since that time, I've been kind of looking for it and I didn't realize how much of it is out there. There's a lot of that out there. So these are reservoirs for this thing to build before the soybean crops get in, particularly your clovers. Uh, cotton, I keep getting asked this question about cotton. They will feed on cotton. We don't think they prefer cotton. If you got cotton adjacent to soybeans that you're not controlling them in, in cotton, they will wreck a few rows of it. Rarely, I think, will they move across a cotton field and be a problem, but I was opening bowls next to some soybeans I had this year and three would run out of every brack. I mean, they were tattooing it. But this only went into field six, eight rows or so. It was not a, a big deal. They preferred to be in, in the soybeans. Since that time, I think Gus has seen uh, even immatures in sorghum, which was very unusual. And I've even seen egg masses all over Palmer Amaranth. But I think late in the year, when there's not a lot of host, they're gonna try to utilize things they ordinarily would not. So why are we so worried about this, this stink bug? I mean, we've had stink bugs, right? We've talked about the ones we've always had. It's the damage potential. All right, these are some beans that I had here in Starkville, and I know they look horrible. These were late planted beans and they got Phomopsis all over them. We did not spray them and they were ate up with red banded stink bugs. Of course, the elevator wouldn't dump them. Eddie, you still in here? Eddie called me, man, he was in a, in a panic. He said, man, none of your beans, can we, we can't sell them. He said, we're gonna have to bury them all. And I said, I know, I was, I was letting them go so I could collect them. <laughs> he said, well, we need to do a better job of that next year. But this thing, I'm telling y'all, this thing is different than these other stink bugs. It is very different than these other stink bugs. And one of my biggest fears is, is some of our earlier planted beans that just caught the tail end of these things to some extent. We had some really good yields in those beans that I think that I, my biggest fear is that we might not respect the, 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 the fact that this one's so damaging, because I can promise you it is. Another thing that we've been seeing, this is a picture by Blaine Viator, he's a consultant in, in Louisiana. He put this up on Twitter, it kind of made its way around the world. We got our own pictures of this as well. When they move into those beans early, uh, Don Cook had some at R5. Uh, I had some that seemed like the biggest effect was more around R3. They will stay green, they'll stay green forever. This is happening, what I believe, is much earlier than later. What you're looking at in this picture was where one spray was missed. Beans on the left were sprayed three times, the one on the right was two, if I remember Blaine telling me the story right, and that's the difference. So they can cause this, but we think, we're beginning to think this is occurring earlier rather than later. So fortunately our earlier planted beans did not have them. So what we saw come through some of the earlier planted beans, you likely would not have seen this from. Now there's lots of late planted beans planted mid to late June 
that look like this, um, but that was because they were there all, all year. So what's the difference in this thing? Really, they feed no different as far as the amount of times they'll puncture a seed compared to a southern green or some other ones. This is a lot of work out of, by a guy named Panizzi out of Brazil. They've done a tremendous amount of work on this pest. They don't actually probe seed that don't seem any more than our other species. They can feed on much more mature seed. That is different, and this is in the literature. And their damage is much greater. This has been shown. So why is the damage greater? Turns out their mouth parts are not bigger. Some people have, have speculated that the mouth parts alone were just so much bigger. Well, what really turns out from the guys that went in and measured this and studied it, the mouth parts are actually a little smaller. They're not as big as the species that we're used to dealing with. But here's the kicker right here, the second bullet point. This has been proven. The enzymes in their saliva, when any of these piercin sucking insects, it don't matter what you're talking about. If you've got a mouth part that you need to stick into a plant, you've got to dissolve that tissue with some kind of enzyme so it can be uh, liquefied so you can bring it up that tube into your body. This stink bug, the enzymes in its saliva are much, much more damaging compared to any other species they've ever looked at. That's the kicker. That's why we're seeing this. That's why we believe we're seeing this. Secondly, even though their mouth parts or small, two minutes, come on, you work for me, get out of here. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Although, although the, their, their mouth parts are smaller, they do probe deeper into the sea. So here's what I want to go over. This is the main part. We are very, very confident in our thresholds for stink bugs that we commonly deal with, green, southern greens, and browns. Nine for 25 sweeps, double at R6, terminate at R6, five. We're very confident. The problem comes in, and Gus is going to talk about this. The problem comes in, this is what so many of us dealt with last year, is when can we quit? When can we quit? We've been treating at four per 25 sweeps. I feel pretty good about that number. What we have never felt good about is when can we quit? Based on all the work that Gus and Nick did in Arkansas that I did in Mississippi, what we're saying now, we actually published this in our threshold, in our guide last year, but moved away from it. But what we're saying now, and I think we feel pretty good about it, Gus is going to elaborate a lot more on this. Once we get to R6, between R6, R6, 5 and R7, in that period, we think we can raise this threshold back to 10, unless we're in a period where we got a bunch of rain coming. Now we need to adjust and we need to do things a little bit different. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure what to tell you that we're going to recommend perfectly there. But what I can tell you is if the rain moves out and we got really good weather, we can tolerate a lot more of these. That's what I'm telling you. So after R7, if the weather is good, I think we're going to quit spraying for these things. And we're pretty confident. Gus is going to show you that. So moving into to, to 2018, if I could give you one piece of advice, it's going to be plan early. Now, I know we always say that, you know, plan early. I know you can't plan everything early. But what I can tell you is if you get into a situation where you're planting mid-June and this thing's going to be there, we're going to have some problems. Then there's always going to be exceptions to the rule. But early is much better than later. So the last thing I'm going to tell you is we, we have done a lot of ditch bank surveys. We do them every year. I'm going to need 30 seconds with you. Every year we do these ditch bank surveys, and honestly, they don't mean a whole lot. We can find a million gazillion plant bugs and they never show up in the cotton or whatever. But with this one pest, with this red banded stink bugs, I think we very accurately predicted last year, based on what we were finding, all the way up north of Highway 82, that they were going to be an issue this year. And we're going to do more of it. So what that's telling us is this thing is so sensitive to cold weather. If we have a cold winter, if we cannot find these things in the spring, they're either going to have to make their way from south Louisiana up here to cause a problem for us, or they're not going to be there. And we don't know that yet, but if we're finding these things in March, in April, like we did last year, immatures and everything else in crimson clover, probably can guarantee you they're going to be just as big of an issue. And that's when we need to start really thinking about some of these late planted beans and how we're going to manage it.